Hey, welcome to the Brandon and Sage uh, and Nettie show. Today we have a special guest. We have Marja on our show. Um, she is a entrepreneur, a world-renowned uh, speaker. She's an international attorney, um, and she has her uh, best-selling author and the owner of Author Writers Academy. Before we dive in, can you just um, tell the audience a little bit about your business, what it is that you do? Yeah, sure. I help entrepreneurs, especially successful, busy entrepreneurs, to be seen, heard, elevated, known, and remember I take them that desire in their heart to become an author which often has been there for years and even decades and I help it to come true in a fast fun easy way my team and I really get their core message their authentic voice uh, out into the world so people really know who they are can see what they've gone through what they've overcome what they've learned and um, how they serve and what's the I guess the story behind why you started this business where is the, the passion come from with the how does it come about? Yeah, well, my first ever published book was Fork Disease, Go Vegan. And it was, uh, I wrote that book when my sister and I had our health and wellness company. And that was a long time ago. And we wanted to share some of our wisdom with our clients, beyond our clients, with the world. And so started to write this book. I knew nothing about the publishing industry. and But I just knew I had a passion and a love that I wanted to share and knowledge that I wanted to get out. And so I went with a traditional publishing house and it was a painful journey <laughs> they uh, did not offer much help any help they did offer they wanted more and more and more money they took um, ownership of my rights in the book it was I had to figure everything out myself I didn't have a coach I didn't have a team ten years later I was still trying to finish that same book and I thought this is a disconnect here. Putting something in the world that's good, that's making a difference, should not be painful to the giver. So I decided, you know, when I finally published that book, we published it, and I said, I'm never publishing another book again. I'm never writing another book. It was awful, it was painful. I don't want that experience. And for someone like me who has been writing my entire life, I knew it wasn't a writing issue, it was an industry issue. You know, never say never. <laughs> A couple of years later, while we were still in business, I, I published an e-book, a cooking holiday vegan cookbook, and published that myself and learned some things, made some mistakes, uh, found out the importance of marketing and things like that. And uh, you guys, the amazing marketers that you are, understand the value of that. But I was like, I never want to do this again. I was still practicing as an attorney while we had that health and wellness company. When I moved overseas, I was working as an attorney representing the federal U.S. government in deals with foreign companies and foreign countries. One day, I woke up with words just kind of pouring through me. I couldn't stop it, and I had I was compelled to write. And I got up and I started writing these words just flowing through me, and this happened over and over, three, four in the morning, again and again. And I'm like, why doesn't God like wake you up at a normal hour? Why does it always have to be at like 4 a.m.? <laughs> And I heard, because you don't listen when it's a normal hour. <laughs> and so there I was, days, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks, this was happening. When the words stopped flowing, I read what I wrote. Um, I didn't have a coach like me behind me telling me about the mindset stuff. And, and I read it, and I'm like, oh, I'm not publishing that. And I was in my ego and worried about, like, what are people going to think of me? I don't even understand half of this, what I wrote here, what flowed through me. And, and I was afraid to publish it, quite honestly. So I hid it on my computer for two years. I showed it to one person, a friend of mine in the UK, and she was just like, Marja, you have to publish this. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> and so there it sat on my computer. I was working as an attorney. It was very, very difficult, lonely job. I was very good at it. However, what I was doing was basically soul crushing. I know a lot of people can relate to having a job that on the surface it looks like the quote American dream. You know, everyone's telling you you've made it. Everyone's telling you uh, you should be happy and what you should feel. But you know that there's a disconnect between what you're doing and what you're meant to do. And I was yeah, I was feeling depressed and I was crying very painful turns. And one of my coaches, Tony Robbins, he always says, you know, it doesn't take a long time to make a decision like a lot of people think. A decision is made like that, a heartbeat. My heart beat very differently one day when I went into work, and it was just one piece of BS too many. <laughs> I went into the office, and after sitting in the parking lot that morning, gathering my courage and my stillness within myself to walk into the building yet again, 
uh, on that seventh year of doing that job, went into my office, unpacked my briefcase, and the phone rang. And it was a stupid internal phone call about some bureaucracy BS that just didn't really matter in terms of service, in terms of helping people. It was just somebody living in their ego with a power trip. And I got in that moment, I don't know why that was the, they say it's the straw that breaks the camel's back, you know, not the brick. It's just this one little thing too many. And on any other day, I probably would have just brushed it off and dealt with it. On that day, I was like, and I put down the phone call, and that phone, and there was like a resolve inside of me that it was a good knowing, a stillness, that this pain that I allowed to go on in my life was over. And I packed up my desk that I, um, and put all my things back in the briefcase, <sighs> took a sigh of relief, and I got up from my desk, turned off the light, and locked the door. I walked to the personnel office, and I said, I'm done. And I still remember, he looked at me and said, start your paperwork. And I started crying. But at that moment, it was, it was, they were different tears. Before, all the tears that I was experiencing every morning before I went to work at lunchtime onto my desk <laughs> when I was curled into a ball wondering why am I torturing myself, trying to fulfill what everyone else said was my American dream. But this were different tears. It was tears of joy, tears of relief, tears of knowing that I finally use the voice to say what I really wanted to say. How it, empowering was that for you? It was so empowering that manuscript that was hidden on my computer for two years, that was the moment I heard from God about it again. And when I walked out of the office, I heard in my spirit, it's time. And I knew it was about that. And at that moment, I was so open, so out of my ego and out of myself, I said, okay. And when I said, okay, all of the resources, all of the knowledge, all of the people, everything I needed just started to come out of the woodworks, form around me, um, come to me. And I published that book, and it was called The One Law for Amazing Abundance in Every Era of Your Life. And it was, became a bestseller in the US, in the UK, and in Germany. And I was like, this was such a different experience. Like from my first book to this book, the publishing of this one, the creation of this one was flowing and easy and fun and beautiful. And I thought this is the experience that every person who wants to publish a book ought to have. And so I put on my attorney brain, which is always analyzing, dissecting, and thinking how, what. And I reverse engineered, how could I make this experience possible for others? So what I did was uh, figured it out. And at that time, the bishop of my church in New Jersey, I was living in Germany at the time, but I was going still in, with my same church. And I was attending a service um, via Zoom or internet, you know, over the internet rather, and um, I heard him mention that he had been trying to write a book for 10 years, and he had all of these pages and papers, and he couldn't quite, and the pain that he was speaking was so familiar, and I reached out and I said, I can help you with that, and he was like, really? And he knew that I had just published an international best-selling book, and so he hired me. And just a couple of months later, he was standing there holding his best-selling book with his wife and his three daughters, trying to fight back tears of satisfaction and gratitude. And I knew that I was onto something. But at that time, another woman reached out to me in my mastermind, and in one of my masterminds, and she said, can you help me do that too? I said, I absolutely can. And she was my second client, and Author Writers Academy was born. That's awesome. So my question to you is, when you first started your business, you kind of like jumped in, jumped from your, your professional career and left that life. As some, and then obviously you grabbed your first client. How did you? How did you? I guess decide on on pricing because I know a lot of people when they're first jumping into something, it's like, well, how do I set the the, the price for this? And also. What were some of the first things that you set up to kind of brand yourself as someone who is coming from a professional career to 
to this new world of entrepreneurship. Yeah, so, well, I had been, without realizing it, uh, thinking back and speaking to one of my clients and writing his book. He's a serial entrepreneur, and in conversations with him, I realized I have been too. I've been running businesses my whole life. My first company was, I was eight years old, and most people, they start, you know, they have their lemonade stand, and they're selling their lemonade, and, and there was something a little bit different about my lemonade stand. I also sold cookies and candy, and and I went into my house and looked for things that were not being used, and I repurposed and repackaged them and had those out there for sale. And then I guess this is the entrepreneurial spirit part. Instead of limiting my stand to what I could do with my little hands, I recruited the other kids in the neighborhood to run my stand, so it was running all day, every day, and uh, I paid them in candy, and uh, I knew the value of cash. <laughs> and. Um, and the little kids, they were happy to work for candy. And uh, that was uh, my first venture. <laughs> and, wow. and two things I remember that I learned from that, from that, of course, well three, the power of having a team. I learned that when you can see things in a different way, uh, you can help other people see them in that way. They were, I remember there were these rug samples, uh, a book of rug samples in the house. And of course, nobody's using them. It's just garbage once you pick your rug. And I noticed that there were these little sticks in between all of the rug uh, um, pieces. And I pulled out one and I was like, these are pickup sticks. And I pulled all of the sticks out of the rug book bundled them together, labeled them as pickup sticks, and sold them for $5. And I remember there was a man coming home from work, and he, uh, and the train station was up the street, and he walked past, and he saw, he's like, pickup sticks. I was like, yes. How much? $5. And, Straight face. Yeah. And he bought pickup sticks for $5. And I was like, wow the power of seeing what others don't see. Other people saw garbage. I saw an opportunity. And the other lesson I learned in that first venture was about a hostile takeover. Eight. <laughs> At eight years old. At eight years old, there were some teenagers in the neighborhood <laughs> who saw uh, that I was onto something. They saw this success. And uh, they decided to force my employees away <laughs> with their size and strength uh, to work for them and duplicated what I had created. Uh, made their own stands and had the kids working for them and I closed up shop and walked away. I decided it wasn't worth the fight and I knew I had more ideas in me and, but that was my first business ever and uh, I over the years, over the decades, I had other companies. I had a t-shirt company where, again, I was always good with words and ideas and putting things together. And so I had sayings that I wrote on t-shirts and, and that company was called PKTs, uh, which PK stand for uh, Pastor's Kids. My grandfather was a pastor and so, <laughs> and, and it would, that t-shirt company was my words e expressing Bible verses, and and uh, so I remember doing like hiring uh, churches, doing modeling shows with those, and selling those. Um, getting a vendor to to create those, all kinds of things. I was figuring it out on the fly, um, and so I had lots of different ventures. I had a doll company where I was making uh, dolls. I was I was taking black Barbie dolls, which were basically at the time unwanted, unseen. You know, everybody wanted the, the white blonde dolls, nobody, and so the, the black Barbie dolls were often left to the side, um, not valued. Um, they were much, much cheaper. And so what I started doing is going around the stores, buying up uh, in bulk anytime I saw black Barbie dolls. Sometimes I got them as cheap as $3. And uh, I used skills that I had gathered over the years. At one point I was um, thinking about being a fashion designer. I knew how to sew. And, and so I started sewing Afrocentric clothing for the dolls. And I braided their hair and, and made it a very special way. And I mounted them. And, and I took these $3 unwanted, unseen Barbie dolls and I made them something really beautiful. And my first show, I walked in, I think I had 40 of these dolls. And 
all in the pricing for everything, materials, because I bought um, the remnants of materials from stores and other little pieces. All in, I think it cost me between five to seven dollars to make each doll. I went to a show and sold them for Forty-five dollars a piece, and which were a pretty good margin. I sold out in three hours and took orders for more for the next day. So I stayed up all night making new ones to fulfill the orders to, for the next day. It was so uh, so many things happening all at once, and my sister Jasmine came, basically nursed me back to help, health, help me through that difficult time. And again, I hope people have somebody in their life that shows up for them when they're broken and can't show up for themselves, and Jasmine was that for me. And when I started to get my strength back within me, I decided I didn't want to move to another state with this job that I hated, you know, as a civilian practicing law for it. And I said, I, I can go back in the military. And instead of going into the rough world of the Army, I decided to apply for the Air Force. So the Air Force story, as you said, um, I applied for the Air Force and I said, no, you're from the Army, you're damaged goods. <laughs> They've already broken you, we don't want you. <laughs> and uh, But no one tells me no. <laughs> and so they turned down my application, I put it in again, and they said, well, you're missing this. And I fixed that, applied again. And they came up with, they had turned it down again, came up with another reason to turn it down. And even though it wasn't true, I did what they said and applied again. And when they realized I was just going to keep applying, instead of turning it down, they just held it. And so I started to call. I called every single day. And, and I just called to find out the status of my application. And when I hear Les Brown telling the story about how he got the job at the radio station, I laugh because I did the same thing. And. Um, and uh, I was, I was uh, at an event speaking, uh, he was speaking at backstage and I was telling him that we had this similar experience, it was just awesome. And, and so yeah, I called every day and Miss Simon, uh, please don't call here again. Uh, we don't know the status, we'll let you know when something, when we know something. Okay, thank you so much, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And I hung up and I did this over and over and over again until one day I got a phone call first. And he was like so excited, I think he was more excited than I was because he didn't have to talk to me anymore. <laughs> and then he was like, Miss Simon, they said yes, they accepted your application to the Air Force. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And that's how I got into the military. Um, into the Air Force, rather, as an active duty Judge Advocate General for my second military branch of service. I was at a formal party uh, with generals and things like this in the D.C. area, and there I am in my formal uniform, and, and I'm speaking with this general, and I hear, Miss Simon? From behind me, and I turn around and say, yes. And this man who I'd never seen before standing there, he said, I knew I recognized that voice. I'm the guy on the phone that you called every day. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, that's a movie. <laughs> that's, a, that's an awesome story of uh, perseverance and kind of getting there. And I see how all that stuff adds up into how you're an entrepreneur today. So I guess my, my question kind of goes back a little bit into the marketing world, but also the importance of kind of like sharing your story and then building yourself up as an expert online, right? So people will kind of get that message and attract it to you. So my, ask, my question is, is, I feel like when you meet a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't understand really how to go about doing that, right? Because when you first take that step, it's like, you don't, you might not even be sure if your story is good enough, right? Yeah. So how do you, how do you go about bundling that story and then packaging that to the world? And how did you go about doing it? Yeah, so well, I think, all of us have that voice inside of us that says, who wants to hear me? Maybe I'm not ready. What if I'm not good enough? Uh, my story is not complete yet, whatever that means. Um, I'll do it when I succeed in something else. And so we put it out there. Um, we let all of those voices of all of the people in our lives tell us that we're not ready. You know, And we actually, at some point, internalize those voices and those external voices suddenly have the sound of our own voice and 
that I think is the most tragic thing of all. And so it's my mission. I tell people I'm a grave robber. I've seen so many stories go to the grave, never to be seen, never to be heard, never to be read, because they were waiting until, because they were afraid, because they took on the lies of other people telling them that it wasn't possible, that they weren't worth listening to. And so my job as the grave robber is to rob the grave of all of those stories that are going into it and instead putting it into the hearts and the hands uh, and the heads of the people whose lives it'll change. And like I said, I've always been able to see what others don't see as possible. And I see that in every single person I speak to. You have a story. You have a light inside of you that somebody else needs in their darkest hours. You have figured something out in some area of your life. And I know this because you're here. And so it's a matter of getting you to see and recognize that value. And so all I am is a mirror for you. And I ask you, I use my attorney skills and I interview you and I ask you questions so that you can finally also see who you really are. And I'm not telling you who you are like other people do. I'm just asking you questions and you, your heart, your inside, from inside out, you're telling you who you are finally. And uh, it's the process I start with, with all of my clients. Because when they come and they like, I had this desire to become an author for years. And it's their true voice wanting to be heard. And so that's all I am. I am a conduit for that true voice. I'm a platform for, to, uh, for them to, to, to bring it out into the world. And I am that cheerleader for them, that coach for them. I have the team that I've developed and trained and built um, these amazing talents around them to do everything from idea to publish best-selling book um, so that all they have to do is show up in their gifts and their authenticity. That's awesome. Oh. That makes sense. It's, it's a hard thing to grasp, but once you, once you get it, it's like you said, you kind of have to pull from people. I guess... Um, question goes back into this because it sounds like you went a lot through your journey to get here and I've heard you mention you know teams about like five or ten times so yes. I'm assuming that's something that's pretty important um, how do you go about I guess building a team around you and, and then also being able to actually manageably or successfully manage that team Wow good question <laughs> uh, we often, as human beings, have again bought into another lie that in order to be truly successful, we have to do it ourselves. We have to go it alone. We have to figure it out. We have to forge our own way. And it's the biggest load of bull. <laughs> you know, when we were in elementary school, in high school, college, um, and we'd learn things, and then they'd give us the test. And if you looked over at the person's paper next to you or ask, whispered, hey, what's the answer to number three? What did they call that? Cheating. Cheating, yeah. yes. And so they taught us from children that it was bad to do things with other people. And as an entrepreneur, you have to flip that over and realize it's not cheating, it's collaboration. And that's the only way to elevate. That's the only way to grow. That's the only way, because you have a piece, I have a piece, you have a piece. And when we come together, it's a mastermind. You know, and it's not one plus one plus one equals three. It's one plus one plus one equals three billion. It's infinite. And, and so learning and seeing the power of collaboration, not cheating, shows you that a team is a must. Um, like most entrepreneurs, when I first started the company, I was doing everything, you know, <laughs> and so I can do everything, but I can't do everything exceptionally well. And by hiring a team, uh, the first thing I did was I 
and thanks to one of my coaches, uh, Preston uh, Brown with uh, YBL, Your Best Life, um, and, and his partners, my coaches, Dean and Chuck, they taught me so much about business and teams and elevating and, and all of the things that it takes to make that work. And, and they gave me the assignment. They said, write down everything that you do in your business. Because one of the things that people make uh, a misstep in when they're trying to hire a team in their business is they try to hire someone just like them to do everything that they can do. Nobody's going to do everything you can do. You're, you're a unicorn. You're an enigma. <laughs> and you're an entrepreneur. However, again, everyone has their gifts. And so by breaking down all of the things that you did to support your gift, each of those becomes job that is. So I have somebody on my team whose gift, she's brilliant at doing graphic designs. And that's her gift. And she's creating the, the, the marketing campaigns for our clients for us to launch their books. She's uh, creating the covers for, for their uh, books so that they have unique, special books that are just theirs. It's none of these, you know, refab stuff offline. It's something that's beautiful and special just for that author. Um, that's her gift. And it's elevated. I have another person who's creating videos for our clients where we show, highlight their business and what they're doing with their book and, and putting that together for them. That's his gift. You know, I know how to do these things, but they know how to make them beautiful and exceptional. And so by breaking down all of the things you know how to do and that you must do in order to support your gift, that's how you start finding your team, finding your tribe. That's a lot of process. That's a lot of thinking. <laughs> that was a really good answer. I think that's, that's an awesome learning lesson revolved around, you know, just the importance of building a team and how to build a team and going about it.